Hi, my name is Keith Cooper, Northlight Images, and in this video I'm going to look at making a print. Now it turns out it's a black and white print and it's quite a large print. Uh, I'm going to be using the Canon TC20M printer that I'm currently testing. And you might think it's a four inch printer. Why would I be printing black and white on a four inch printer? Well, it turns out that uh, with the black and white print mode and a reasonable quality photo paper, you can actually get surprisingly good results. Now, if I was going to show this or sell this print, I'd print it on something like uh, P5000 here, many more inks, um, specific greys, the sort of printer you'd think of using for making black and white prints. However, that's a 17 inch printer and the TC20M is a 24 inch printer. So since I've got it here, since I've got the paper and the ink, I'm going to print big. But what am I going to do a picture of? Well, uh, I recently went on holiday to uh, the Northumberland coast um, in the UK. Great place. Here, this time of year, beaches are desert, diverted, <laughs> deserted. And uh, in fact, almost any time I've ever been there, mo most of the beaches are empty. The weather wasn't particularly great this time, but I took with me, um, I'd had a Canon GFX, Fuji GFX 100S here. Here it's got a 30 mil Fuji lens on it, which I took some pictures of using that for some testing. But also here, this is a Canon TSE 24 with a photodiox adapter. So this one gives me an equivalent field of view for 35 mil of around about 24 mil and this about 18 or so. So this is a very wide lens um, with the adapter. Now I'll come back to some issues of the lenses in a little bit, but really I wanted to look at some pictures I took. Um, I always take quite a lot of pictures like this in a situation like this. I felt there was a picture there. Um, here are the images opened up in Bridge. Um, I use Bridge and Photoshop. I do not use Lightroom, particularly when I'm making large prints. I want control of what's in the file and everything at that at a level. Lightroom tries to do too much for you, from my point of view. Now, I don't say don't use Lightroom. I say if you like it, use it but don't feel that you have to follow the Lightroom industry that says how great it is because they sell you training courses. Be prepared to say, no, I don't actually like this catalog says, or whatever it is that you don't like. But what I'm going to do, show an image here. Um, I'll open it up. I'll show some of the editing process that I went through to produce an image ready to make a big print. And we're talking uh, 24 by 36 inch print. Uh, so a large, large print in black and white. And the, and the process I went through. In looking at these uh, images and working through this, I am not going to give a step-by-step -step guide. First of all, the actual editing I did on this, this is uh, a Mac Studio, new one, that I'm setting up. Um, I got this from when I was testing this BenQ monitor. This is a 4K monitor. This is a 2.8K monitor, I believe, with source, but it's a lower resolution one. But they both were, and I'm testing them on this. Uh, the system I edited this on was an older system using the previous version of Photoshop, which won't run um, on the Mac Pro that I've got. So uh, the actual editing of the image I did on another system. So I'm not going to go through in precise detail. First of all, I don't do step-by-step -step guides because to be precise enough to be useful as a step-by-step -step guide, they become useless for a large number of people. I try and emphasize the principles. I'm sorry if you want step-by-step -step guides, there will be loads of people who produced videos with screen captures and things like that, and you just follow the instructions. I prefer to uh, the approach of showing you the principles of what I'm doing and why I'm doing it. That means that if you wanted to do this using Affinity Photo or something else or some other system, you should have no problem with it. It's really about, there's a picture, I want to make a print. What do I think about in the process that takes me from taking pictures, looking at the pictures I've taken, processing to do a print? Turns out the principles are the same. I mean, even if I was printing it on this, it would not be much different. But anyway, to the pictures. This is Drurridge Bay and the tide was out. You could walk along miles of sand. It was a cloudy day, some interesting clouds, but not much structure. 
Um, it just felt like a day that was going to be a, a day for black and white pictures. Um, I like the way the water, the where the tide has gone out, some of the water that's run through it has left little patches of water with the reflections off them and the shapes you get from that. But with anything like this, um, I could never be entirely certain of the composition, what's going to work. Um, I know some people like to plan it all out and decide on the picture and take the picture and do it like that. But to me, it is about the moment and the clouds change between pictures. So you may have two nearly identical pictures from what you're taking, but the clouds have moved slightly and one just fits the balance of the composition better. Um, there is no formality in this. Most people who describe aspects of uh, composition uh, think them up after they've taken the pictures. Um, I've come across very few people who actually apply principles of composition before they take the picture. And to me, that that just deadens the whole effect. There needs to be a degree of spontaneity in it. But then that's that's what works for me, may not work for you. So here's some pictures. These are on, on another server, so it's a bit slow on here. But you can get the general idea. There's a whole series of pictures. I like the sweeping flow of where the water's going. I tried pictures at different heights off the ground to change the, yeah. The but in all of these particular examples, I'm using this 24 mil shift lens. And what I've done is anywhere where the horizon is not across the middle of the picture, and that's most pictures, I've given a little bit of vertical shift or rise as it's sometimes called. And that keeps things that are on the horizon, such as there's some wind turbines and things you can see in the distance if you look at the pictures um, in detail. Remember these 100 megapixels, so there's, there's a lot of detail in them. but if you have a 24 mil lens, equivalent angle, and obviously this is a bit wider, this is about 18 mil, and you tilt it upwards to lower the horizon in it, anything that's on the land will tend to lean inwards. So you'll get pictures, if you've got trees and things like that, they will lean inwards so that. It's the reason you use shift lenses when architectural photography is to present, prevent that with buildings. So here's some pictures. These have got a bit of rise on them, and it's really, it also helps stretch the sky a little bit, which can make it look a little bit more active. Now, I've done some um, uh, videos looking at use of shift lenses in landscape and that with diagonal shift and vertical shift and things, and how it changes the apparent perspective of the lenses. Hence Nikon's name for these lenses, perspective control lenses. It does not control perspective. It lets you, um, lets you treat the existing perspective, because that's based on where you are, in slightly different ways. But here's the images of various bits. So, so there's a few shots that I've done looking at, uh, looking across the beach. Uh, there's a rock that was sticking up in the beach. There's some people. There's, they're all very similar. Now, just for an example, uh, this, this was one I picked because I thought it would make a good black and white image. I'll just open this one up in Bridge. Now, I... Uh, from Bridge, open it up in Adobe Camera Raw. Now, I have tested this image also using um, DxO Photo Lab, the latest version of that. Photo Lab 7, I believe it is up to now. Um, and it works fine. Doesn't make much difference for this. Um, it's base ISO, so I'm not worried about noise. I do, however, I have identified a problem with this lens. Sometime in the last year or so, I gave this lens a bit of a, a bang because there is a slight ding on the side here. That, I think, has decentered some of the elements. This needs to go for service at some point because if I have the lens in its normal orientation, this edge of the frame Remember, we're using this on a medium format sensor, so we're using what's the equivalent on the 35mm of, of some shift to show this edge as part of the image circle. Um, there's a slight softness on one edge, not on the other edge. Now, I've noticed that I've done some more testing and it is there, it is real, and typically that comes about from a decentering of elements. So maybe a lens element has shifted slightly in this. It's very slight. Um, I can correct it. I can sharpen. Um, I've used this for work and it's not been a problem, but it is something that I've noticed in some images and particular ones with detail here. So that if I look at close up, they're sharp. And this is an F8. Um, if I look here, 
this is relatively sharp, but the sand on this side of the image is slightly softer, just down this side edge of the image here. And that I suspect is a misalignment of the lens elements. Just something you have to be careful of with lenses like this. Uh, they are robust, but you know, don't ding them against things and do stuff. But uh, yeah, that's something I just have to sort out in that. But there's the image itself though, now that I've sort of opened it up. Now, what sort of adjustments? This is after I've done adjustments to it. What have I done? Now, I'm just going to put it back to to get rid of any adjustments. And we see it goes, that's the auto adjustment, turn that off. There's the original image, it's a little flat. So what I've done is, there we go, let's go back, step back. There's how I've done it. I've adjusted highlights, shadows. I've started as a test just to see what it sees, use the auto setting. Um, and that's given me a starting point of things I might want to adjust. I've then looked at some of the other sliders here, so I've changed that. I have given a little bit of clarity I've used in the picture. Now, because this is going to be a print, I can do, I could push it up way more than I really want for that, and it brings up some detail. Now, I don't want that much, but I will use a bit of clarity adjustment. That's a local contrast effect that changes uh, on a lar fairly large scale uh, contrast in the image, partly because it's a flat image to start with. Um, no problem with dynamic range on a day like this with a sensor for this one, no problem whatsoever. Um, so I'm going to do a few adjustments on that, but there's no local adjustments really. I don't think this image really needs it. It does, however, for my eyes, composition wise. Now, the four to three sensor of this. For vertical shots, I love the four to three sensor. For horizontal shots, I quite often, and given that I crop, I, 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 over the years, I've regularly cropped 35 mil, uh, three to two uh, images. I quite often add a bit of crop to it. Now, in this instance, all I want to do, because the, the horizon here is roughly a third of the way up the script. Yeah. Yes, good old rule of thirds. Um, I never actually think of it. It's just what works in composition sometimes. Um, some people will throw their arms up in horror if you even mention the rule of thirds. But I found in years of teaching photography, for people who have not the slightest clue what composition means, giving them a tool like rule of thirds can help them. You just make it a sort of generalised advice to do it. So, you know, in, in, drop the horizon a bit. Don't have it run across the middle. Have it up the top. Yeah, it, it's just about that. Now, if people rigidly try and adhere to it and try and do things, well, that's when you're going to run into problems. But what I, I don't want quite this expanse. Now, that's set with the aspect ratio locked, which we do not want. Don't want this aspect ratio, thank you very much. I want something about like that. And that's roughly what I've worked on to produce the image. Now, I've got, this is colour. There's very little colour in it. There's a tiny little patch of blue, a bit blue showing in the sky. But this is an image that I'm just going to print as black and white. Now, I'm not going to open that one. Here's one I made earlier. As you see, it's stronger contrast. What have I done to this image? How have I gone from that colour image, albeit very flat colour image, this one here. Have I gone through to this? Well, first up, I've sharpened it. I've used um, Sharpen AI as a mask, like as a mask layer. This is purely because to correct the softness of the lens on this side. So I've applied Sharpen AI to as a new layer on this, and then I've used a graduated fill uh, of mask on it so that the sharpening effect is only really applied just on the edge here. Um, it's a technique I've discussed, discussed in some reviews and things, but that's not something I would normally do because it's to fix this. I might run Sharpen AI on this as a sort of general sharpening of the lens, but in general, this does not need much sharpening. Uh, the lens is pretty good, apart from, say, just this little edge here. But image sharpening in general is something I've covered in uh, quite a few other uh, videos and, and articles. I might use 
nick sharpener for doing some final print sharpening or i might just as i said up here i might use sharpen ai slight application of it works very well for print sharpening but that's neither here nor there i've got a massive image here because it's taken let's say 100 megapixel sensor how have i converted it into black and white well um, i used the channel mixer in the raw processor and just looked at that and thought well that looks okay um, now i could have also used nick silver effects which i've used for years for black and white i'm I will use it sometimes for conversion, but I'm always very careful if there are some objects in it because it can still slightly produce some halos around things. You have to be very careful. Now in this, there's nothing really obvious that would show it, but certainly if there was say um, a post or something sticking up into this bright sky, I would be very wary about halos around it. So there are lots of different ways of converting to black and white. Now I'm gonna put some notes in the notes of this video that link to articles and things I've done for covering the last 20 years looking specifically at black and white which cover all the details of this but in general I want to up the contrast a bit because the print needs more contrast than works on the screen you'll notice I've got a grey background here I am not working with a black background I'm not working with a white background I find a grey background helps me get the tonal balance now now, I can't really do the editing on this, not because, I mean, this is eminently capable of it. It's more than powerful and more powerful than the machine I do use. But this, these two screens have been hardware calibrated to 4000K so that they look okay on video. In the lighting I've got around here, which is 4K lighting, I could get used to it and I could edit the image here. I am far happier editing on a screen that I'm used to, which is actually at 6500, um, and editing on that and looking at the levels. I find that the if, if I try and do anything on these screens at 4000, yes, it will probably work, but I'm really working one hand behind my back. I don't want to. This is purely for demo uh, for here. So there's the image. I've cropped it. I've applied a bit of sharpening to make up for the problem I've got with this particular lens. Obviously, absolutely no problem whatsoever if I use this 30mm. It's why I'm keen to see the 30mm uh, tilt shift lens that Fuji have just released when I get a chance to try that out because that will be excellent quality all over. There will be no issues with this. Uh, there is lots of detail in this, more than enough detail if you look, if you zoom right in. Um, there is a little bit of noise in it, but it, uh, when, this is for a print, so it doesn't really matter. I've made sure that the whitest white in this is almost white, um, just to have, yeah, for the printing. I think it, on a scale 0 to 255, the whitest part of this just touch on 254. Uh, there's no absolute white in this. Um, it can help with some printers, particularly lesser ink printers like this, this one, the TC20M that I'm printing with. It can help in that respect in that um, you can sometimes get patches of blank paper showing through um, and it doesn't look, the white doesn't look quite right. So having a little bit of ink on it can help, but you need to test things like that with printers. Remember, this is a printer that Canon most definitely do not sell for making prints of photos and stuff like that. This is a poster printer. It's a plotter. Um, it's that it's aimed at. Turns out that it can do good prints, as I'll show in a minute. But anyway, there's the image. Now I've printed that. How am I going to size this? Well, all I do is just go to the image size here. And I set the image size. I don't resample. And I set it at, because I'm going to be printing on 24 inch paper. I want an inch border on it. I'll print, I'll size it to 22 inches. Now that tells me that the resolution of that image at 22 Im inches, this dimension, it's about 37 across this way. Um, by setting it at that size, it tells me that the print resolution is roughly 330, 335 pixels per inch. 
Notice I don't set it to any ma magic number or anything like that. It is what it is. That's because modern printer drivers can handle fractional resolutions. There's, I've done quite a bit of stuff looking at so-called magic resolutions. You should set it to 300, 600, three, you know, whatever, 360. Doesn't matter is basically what I found. So this, I have sized the image here in Photoshop, just using the image size. I've unticked the resample because I don't want to do any resampling or anything like that. And it's come out at the print size I want. It's at about 330, 340 pixels per inch. And that is fine for it. That's all I need for it. So I've got an image for that. And then to print it, how do you print it? Well, the simplest way, and uh, this is this is all it takes. Um, I could use, uh, you know, there are loads of other bits of software for it. Um, but all I'm going to do is just go to print. And there is the print dialog for Photoshop. Now, I've specified in the printer drive, I specified a custom paper size. Now, the custom paper size, I looked at the size of this image and the custom paper size I've made one that is 24 inches by 37 inches or there about 30, 38 inches, whatever, enough to have a bit of a border on it. And I've done that in the settings, in the driver settings, and I've saved that as a custom size. Save as many custom sizes as you like. This is going to print on roll paper. Makes, makes no difference for, you know, for, um, you know, you won't cause any problems by saving lots of paper sizes. There's obviously no standard size that takes this. Uh, this is, this is the size it is um, for this particular paper. I've set here to printer manager's color. If I was printing a color image, I would have selected one of my ICC profiles for the particular paper and printer that I'm using. But this is a black and white one. And in the printer driver, I select monochrome print. There is no advanced black and white mode or special black and white print mode on this that you can adjust things. There is just something called monochrome printing. Now, turns out some papers work better than others, but the photo paper I'm printing on works just fine with this. So I'm going to do that for monochrome printing. Um, in terms of the printer settings, this is running um, MacOS, uh, OS, well, yeah, MacOS 13 or Ventura. Uh, so I haven't updated it to the latest one. I have many years of working on Apple systems and I never ever store, install a dot point zero or point one operating system I always, on a system that I'm working on. I always leave them for a while. Um, you've, you know, fortunately I bought this fairly recently and it came with 13 point whatever it was on it. So I'll leave it at that for a while, particularly once I transfer and this becomes my main machine connected to my main editing monitors over there. So I've got this here set up for printing and I will just go for print and off it goes and it will print. And here after a, a good few minutes, I think it's about 10 minutes or so, is and this is printed on a photo paper as so i'll put the uh, paper details and everything else in the notes for the video but here is the print now i'm going to turn this around hopefully not get too much reflection off it but obviously the lighting i've got here will reflect to some degree now let's put it back down here um let's have a look at the print what's is there anything wrong with it? Uh, well, no. Um, this is, uh, although it's got some creaks in it now because I've manhandled it a bit. It, prints like this, you need to be careful with the handling of them. Um, in terms of the tonality and the lighting I've got here, this looks pretty neutral. Um, it is not the best looking, a slightly cool look to it. It's not the best looking bit of black and white printing I've ever seen, but I can see no details in it. If I get a, a really strong, you know, a loop out or magnifying, a strong magnifying glass, I can see the ink dots in this. Now, you have to get very close and use a magnifying glass to see it. To me, that says anyone who, if you see, put this a print this size on a wall, someone goes up to it and looks at it in enough detail to see that there are ink dots, that the coloured inks have been used as well as the obviously the black. Anyone who does that, well, that's their fault. Um, I have no sympathy for anyone who comes up and says, "Oh no, no, this is not, this is you know, this isn't up to scratch because you know you've used not the right number of inks or anything." Nonsense. This looks fine. Put this on a wall, and most people 
will see a black and white view and they'll ask where it was. Uh, some people who know me will go, hmm, that's a suitably dismal looking picture. But, you know, that's, an that's another matter altogether. Um, but it works very well. Are there any other downsides for this particular printer, the Canon TC20M? Uh, yes, there, there is a bit of bronzing on this. Now, bronzing is, I can see it here because I've got some lights up here as well, smaller lights up here as well as the main light over here. I can see that if I get the angle uh, right, there is a slight, in some of the greys, there is a slight metallic looking sheen to the picture. Now, you only get that when you're looking at it in particular angles, um, and most people wouldn't even see it. Now, I mentioned the problem with the lens. Um, I can, because I know it's there, I can see that sharpness here is a little off in the picture. Once again, nobody is going to notice. And anyone who does notice is another photographer and they never, ever buy people's pictures. Um, yeah, photographers who buy other photographers pictures are few and far between. I can say that because I don't buy other people's work. Um, if I want a picture, I'll go and take it. Um, doesn't mean I don't appreciate pictures by other photographers. I've got thousands of them in all of these books behind me and up the top, all around the room. I've got thousands of them. I just won't go out and buy pictures this size. Yeah. So remember that if you think you want to do a business selling pictures. Now, I've done loads of stuff about the business side of photography, of selling pictures and things. But remember, you have to have a market for your pictures. All right. So there we go. There is a view, Drurridge Bay. Um, it's very nice. Um, I, you know, as, a, as, a, as a picture, it's, it's reminded me that I need to, I'm going to need to get my lens serviced. For it because it is absolutely pin sharp over that side and you can see there is a general progression across the picture of not quite so sharp much sharper here less so here and and this is after i've applied some sharpening to it so you know, could i process anything differently well you, it's about your choices as to what matters for you in terms of composition and stuff i like this slightly wider landscape look um it suits uh, you know, how I tend to view things. Um, I've done some other pictures and well. Now, the, the downside of this, this one is that, as I say, this was taken while I was on holiday and I was going to take quite a lot more photos and things. But unfortunately, as, as some of you regular viewers uh, may know, my father had been seriously ill in hospital for a while and unfortunately he died whilst we were away, um, which sort, sort of thing puts a bit of a dampener on the on the holiday. And more to the point, actually, just I just couldn't be bothered to go out and take some photos most of the time. I still had a, we, we had a reasonable time insofar as we are. But um, yeah. So, uh, yeah, this this one is uh, one for me, dad. And uh, well, anyway, I will be doing, you know, once we sort things out, I will be coming back and the videos will pick up again. And I'll do be doing a few more videos. But I just wanted to say that for people who stick through to the end of things and that uh, thank you to those of you who have emailed me and expressed your you know, wishes towards his health and that. And uh, anyway, black and white print, Drurridge Bay. TC20M printer, actually rather nice for the printer. Um, I'm sure Canon actually may not be that happy that I tell people how good this printer can be um, because it's not marketed as a photo printer. Anyway, if you've got any questions, let me know. I'll try and put some more detail in the notes to this of things that may be of help. Um, and I'll do a few more. I, I did take some photos. So I'll be doing a few more bits and pieces. I've got a few colour ones as well I'll look at as well. But in general, the key to this is take quite a few pictures to start with. Experiment with your viewpoint. Convert to black and white if you like. Don't try and do too much in the processing. Don't push it too far. Sometimes push it and then drop it back a bit to get it to look good. And when it comes to printing, certainly with a GFX 100S, um, the amount of detail you get in the pictures means that you don't need to do much to them. So thanks for watching and oh, please do subscribe to the channel. It is appreciated. Thanks very much.